start planning early and communicate what you're doing. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I'll be speaking with Jonathan Morrison, an architecture correspondent of The Times. In this role, he has written about subjects as diverse as life on Mars, drone killing lasers, billion pound football stadiums, and a pink unicorn glove puppet named Mr. Grunwald. His articles have also been published in Medium, The Sunday Times, The American Surgeon, The German Network, Physical Review B, The Good Men Project, No Techie, and Airmail. And in this episode, we discuss a very interesting topic, which is often one of the biggest challenges a firm will ever face, and that's what happens when the founder or founders of a practice move on. So we look at Jonathan's recent publication that he has written in collaboration with Ing Media, where he interviewed some fantastic architecture practices from around the UK, Henning Larson, RSHP, Hawkins Brown, MBBJ, Mika, uh, Bennett's Associates, Grimshaw, Robert Adam, and Adam Architecture and the Arab Group. And in those conversations, Jonathan reviewed and studied and probed into how these companies had successfully moved through the succession planning process. So, and Jonathan sits down and discusses some of his findings. So it's a fascinating conversation. um, And as I said, one of the most important challenges a firm will ever face. So sit back, relax and enjoy Jonathan Morrison. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Jonathan, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolute pleasure. So, um, a little bit of an un, uh, a, a different type of guest today. Normally, we're always speaking with architects and and business owners, but you're um, a journalist, and you're you've you've written about architecture, and and most recently, you've you've worked with Ing and written a publication about succession planning, which is a deeply fascinating topic in architecture and many practices have kind of dealt with it in different ways. And you spoke with um, practices like Henning Larson and RSHP and you know some other real great um, um, architecture businesses to kind of get to the a, a deeper understanding of this topic. My first question is why? What, what, <laughs> um, it- what, what attracted you to this? Um, it started really with thinking about um, one of our greatest architects, Richard Rogers, who I would interviewed several times, and mm-hmm. um, obviously he's now sadly passed away. But at, at, when this project began, he just stepped down from his own practice, Rogers Sturk Harbour and Partners. Um, yep. So it was. Um, it, it really started with thinking what would happen to them and talking to some of the people there, and um, say he's now sadly passed away. But and how they deal with his legacy, uh, how they continue really to go forward as a as a business. Um, so it seemed quite an interesting topic from from the get go. And I had a bit of time during lockdown, um, so I started writing about this in uh, collaboration with ING Media, who very uh, uh, kindly wanted to get involved and uh, produce the the ultimate sort of um, report stroke book on uh, succession planning. Mm-hmm. And what were some of the things um, that that in at RSH, RSHP specifically, that you found quite fascinating or innovative? Yeah, I mean, it, they seem to be um, sort of leaders in this for a number of reasons. Um, but I think the thing that struck me most was how early on they tried to identify uh, partners who would be the successors there. So uh, people mm-hmm. like Graham Sturk were really sort of picked out at the age of about 30 and then groomed for uh, a leadership position. Um, you know, 20, 20 years later, which, which seems just incredibly sort of prescient and also showed how much value they attach to this sort of process. Um, and I, I do think there's a lot to learn from from uh, them in particular because they seem to have managed it incredibly well. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no, it, 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 they kind of went through their their rebrand of going from the Richard Rogers partnership to RSHP, and you know Richard was still very much part and parcel of the of the package and was thinking about legacy and and moving on and and it's been very interesting to see as well the the kind of media campaign if you like and that's the right the right word but the kind of the way that um graham and ivan have established themselves as independent thought leaders with their own characters and their own you know kind of separate but also you know upholding the values of rshp um they've done they've been very successful in doing that yeah, and, and for them, I think, sort of speaking to a number of their senior uh, people, it is all about upholding the values and making sure that, not not that just that they've got jobs to go to, but also that they, the charity that they support uh, has, a, has a lifeline as well. Um, so it's it's been a very interesting sort of process, speaking to all the people involved in that, and as you say, uh, and a lot of other big firms as well. So how would you describe succession? What what is it if we were to kind of take a step back and uh, practice is starting to think about this and and what sorts of options are available? Yeah, I mean, it, um, at its most basic, it, it's how you ensure your business has uh, its own life after you, the founder, has decided to retire. Um, it's passing the the torch on, hand, handing on to future generations what you've created, and that can be quite an emotional thing. Um, People that don't necessarily want to think about their own careers coming to an end, um, but those who want to ensure that you know their, their firm goes from strength to strength, um, kind of do need to start planning this at quite an early stage. How, um, w- when you were compiling the report, how did you identify the practices that you wanted to include? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a question of sort of trying to make uh, the practices as diverse as possible. So we were talking to. Um, quite small practices like Adam Architecture, uh, who are, provide a bit of a case study of what can go horribly wrong, mm-hmm. um, all the way up to really massive practices like MBBJ in the US, uh, Roger Stoke Harbour Partners here in the UK, um, big firms, internationally renowned firms, people doing really important projects. Uh, and also we spoke to Arup, uh, the engineers who uh, quite often advise other people on this. So it was really to, to try and get as broad a spread as possible. Um, and I think we've achieved that, hopefully. I noticed you, you also spoke with, uh, with, with Grimshaw yeah. as well. And, they, and they've been, it was interesting, Mark Middleton wrote an article this week in the AJ um, that was kind of talking or kind of talking about elements of the succession planning and how Grimshaw perhaps has, has moved away from the original vision that um, Nick Grimshaw himself had, but they've very much kind of held on to the values of the, of the company. What were some of the insights that you were getting with those guys? Uh, from Grimshaw? Um, well, I mean, having interviewed Nick a couple of times, um, he he was quite sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of laissez-faire about it almost to start off with. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I think his quote was that, uh, you know, every time people came to him and suggested they should off- open an office in Sydney or Melbourne or somewhere else, he would just go, oh, okay, go on then. Uh, <laughs> There wasn't that much structure to it, but they've they've now become much more professional about this, and they have um, you know a very very sort of clever uh, way of handling things, which is to sort of rotate the the leadership constantly mm-hmm. through all the sort of the, the various heads in all their various offices. Um, and it's it's one firm which you'd have to say is going from strength to strength. I mean, some of their recent projects have just been amazing. I'm, I'm thinking of London Bridge Station in particular, which is one of my yeah. favorites. But they um, they really do seem to be hitting their, their stride if, if they weren't before but um they, they they do seem to produce some really good architecture amazing and w- which one of these companies were more than one succession so with as mbbj they would have gone from one yeah. more than one succession yes absolutely yeah i mean they, they were talking about being on their, their sort of sixth generation of leaders um wow which is it, it was really interesting speaking to them because it succession is really at the heart of what they do they again they identify leaders quite early on and they try to put a structure in place where um, leadership is, is passed quite seamlessly from generation to generation and, and through uh, through the ages. Um, and they again, they, they seem to be, be handling it very, very well. Um, what's interesting about them, I think, was that they were saying that the every sort of generation brings its own sort of a, approach or, or style of leadership. Um, mm-hmm. So after the founders, the, the next generation is 
they say, um, you know, sort of kind of one followers, people, acolytes, people who possibly don't have that much originality. So for them, it's all about renewing themselves every time in order to make sure that they're still at the cutting edge of architecture, um, mm. which I thought was a really sort of fascinating thing to be to be aiming for. How, how, do, how does a company not lose its its kind of core identity, if you like, going through the succession plan? Because this is always the, yeah. the really difficult difficult thing. And, and, and some, some might suggest, well, why don't we just call the business something completely different? And that, that has worked. Um, I mean, we, we were talking to Rick Mather Architects, uh, now Micro Architecture, um, who had a horrible time after their founder was, you know, terminally ill and he died quite suddenly. Mm. Um, and they went through a rebranding just to kind of almost shrug off some of the, the bad press that, that came with that. So they were being told that they couldn't handle the projects going forward. So they, they felt they needed a sort of um, rejuvenated identity. Um, so, I mean, that, that sort of thing is... is is entirely possible, but um, I think for the most part, what came through was that people who identify as successors early on are the ones who stand the most chance of maintaining their values and their style through to the next generation, um, because you then have a process of uh, certainly at Roger Stoke Harper and Partners, you know, they they almost had twenty years to get used to sort of filling the role that they would take on in in some ways. So um, it is, yeah. I mean, we were talking quite big. You know, decades-long planning processes, but um, that seems to be the way forward. How did some of these practices identify successes? Um, I mean, again, they they all have very different ideas about this, but um, certainly Roger Stoke Harbour and Partners again. Um, what they were very keen to do is not only just look for design talents, but also people who brought a range of business skills, um, mm-hmm. so people who were able to communicate effectively, um, people who possibly had other skills and draw so someone who could get on top of finances for example um and so they were looking at quite a sort of like holistic package they wanted someone or a little group of people who could provide a bit of everything um henning larson again um they're actually sponsoring people to do mbas uh so that to bring the business side of architecture which is not not something that's often taught in, in standard architecture courses you don't you don't really get that much of an insight into business practices um but they want people who can then take it forward in a strategic business way uh, and that seems eminently sensible as well so a lot of it is um identifying people with talent but also making sure they have the right skills upskilling them in order to take on the leadership role in the future and and do any of these practices have a, a kind of um are are younger talents kind of putting themselves forward does does that happen quite a bit where we see lots of younger partners are asking or kind of chomping at the bit saying look i want to how what do i need to do what what what's the pathway for me to be able to get to becoming a partner yeah absolutely and again successful partners will partners uh partnerships even sorry uh will um have that conversation quite early on um and it is i mean one of the reasons for doing this and um, one reason for putting a succession plan in place is to give people who are young and ambitious a reason to stay put and it's mm-hmm. so that they can see their careers developing at the firm they're at rather than thinking that they have to go away and maybe you find their own practice or find other opportunities so half of it is about staff retention it's how you retain the talent of people you've already got because if they are ambitious they're not going to just wait 20 years for you to retire and hand the reins over they want to know that there is a process they can go through and they can take steps towards perhaps one day inheriting the you know chief executive's title um so it's important from that as well um and especially after brexit we've seen a you know sort of um a lot of architects young french spanish italian architects leaving the country so it's it's even more important than it was before for um big firms to retain their, their talent what's the benefits of owning an architecture practice and do all these succession plans involve ownership are we talking about equity partners in in most cases here or or, or i know i know rshp has a, a slightly unique ownership structure in place where they're actually owned by a by a by a charity yeah um but in most cases are we talking about everyone becoming an owner um to a certain extent i mean a, a lot of these firms are going to, into some called an emplo- employee ownership trust whereby the right. is effectively owned by everyone who works there um, to a different to different degrees, obviously not not everyone has the, exactly the same share. Um, but yeah, it's it's to do with taking over the ownership. It's to do with taking over the leadership role, um, and 
different incentives will be in place in different companies. Um, in uh, BBJ, for example, is very keen to backload the rewards to ensure a seamless handover. You know, if, if the company is doing well, um, you will be rewarded for passing the, the torch on to the next generation. Uh, and that's, that's very much how they've structured it. Mm. So it, it's it's not one size fits all, but um, we are mostly talking about how people become yeah owners, executives. Because it's 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 an interesting one, you know. When I've, I've spoken to practices before in the past about you know their their succession plan, and you know one younger generation starts to buy out the older generation, and there might be you know the, we're talking about millions of pounds in some cases, and well, most young architects don't have millions of pounds sitting around. So how do they actually go about? buying out the, the the partner and sometimes we see deferred compensation plans yeah. but then you know well, what sorts of what sorts of financial plans did you you see in the practices that you were talking with um, I mean that's a difficult question we didn't we didn't ask them ask them exactly how they were being uh, rewarded for <laughs> for this process but um, the, the the incentive has to be there people have to be um, rewarded for moving on and people have to be rewarded for moving up um, and I think one of the, the key pieces of advice from Tristan Carfi uh, at Arup was oh. sort the finances out, make sure that people aren't, you know, uh, feeling disappointed, make sure that people aren't coming back and asking for more money. Um, mm -hmm. once you, once you get the money sorted, that should be it. No, no, uh, no compromises, no, um, no recriminations, um, get this sorted and everything else will sort of kind of follow to a certain extent yeah yeah and and then and then what do practices do in terms of so you're saying you know when they've done it when it's been done very well there's been a long sort of we're talking decades type of plan and yeah. the branding can happen you know over over many many years it's not a sudden announcement it gives time to to build up the personal brands of each of the new partners and how they kind of inter interrelate with the the office brand or the, the practice brand. Um, what happens when it goes wrong then? Were there well, examples? Yes, we, we do it not work a big example in, in the book, which is of uh, Robert Adam and Adam Architecture, the firm that he set up and which uh, obviously bears his name, um, where he was, was, as he put it, hoist by his own petard. Uh, he put in place a scheme whereby um, he would be forced, well, anyone would be forced to retire at a certain age and then hit that age and was forced to retire. I wasn't that happy about it. Um, <laughs> uh, and has, has since gone on to set up another company of, of his own as well as, you know, doing bits and pieces for them. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think the answer to that is be very clear about what you want. If you don't want to retire, make sure you don't have to. Um, if you put in place a conveyor belt whereby you drop off one end at the age of 65 or 70 or whatever it is, um, don't don't then uh, have cause to complain when that happens to you. I mean, I uh, absolutely understand where he's coming from. It's his firm, but um, mm -hmm. you know, if the system is in place and you're on good relate uh, good terms with the people you work uh, with or who work for you, um, then really this should be almost seamless. Um, that's that's the idea, anyway. Um, but yes, we do we do have a few cautionary tales. And no, it's 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 very interesting, you know that that there's a kind of obviously relinqu like the process of actually letting go of the, the decision making or the leadership or that's you know sounds intellectually like an easy thing to do, but emotionally, when the reality comes to it and you've got other people making decisions now, and perhaps sometimes they might not want to take the practice or do what you thought, that can cause conflict. Yeah. I mean, it can be very emotional, emotional, of course. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's painful letting go. We've, we've all been there. It's, uh, especially if you've, if you've created this firm from nothing, you've worked your, uh, fingers to the, to the bones for for years. Um, and then you have to, you're told you, you have to depart. Then of course you would be, you could be quite upset if this is not something that you're prepared for, if this is not something that you've planned and put in place and, uh, are happy with the outcome. Um, no, I, I mean, I completely understand where Robert and, and other people like him are coming from. How has it changed your perspective on architecture as a profession? I, th I think it, it's shown that for all the, the, the creative side of architecture, which is the side we, we enjoy and we celebrate, um, there does have to be a very serious uh, strand of, of 
business leadership, business planning, of mm-hmm. uh, of doing the finances, all, all that sort of stuff that is perhaps a bit duller than we used to, which we don't we don't necessarily take into to full account. You know, we we used to certainly as a journalist, I'm used to looking at um, amazing buildings and writing about them. I don't I don't necessarily dive that deep uh, beneath the surface to see the uh, the legs of the duck paddling away. Um, yes. So it's it's been it's been interesting finding out about that as well. Um, how how firms manage their human resources, how, how firms put the right financial packages in place, um, and how firms move to a, a sort of things like e- employee ownership trusts or the, all the different models of management and, and running things. Um, so yeah, for me that that was certainly interesting. But as I say, there were the um, the big things for me were were finding out just you know quite how, how rigorous some of this planning is, especially Rochester Carbon Partners, you know, if they're looking at a 20 year process, that, that sort of blew me away. Yeah. And so if you were to be advising uh, like a practice on the do's and don'ts of succession plannings, what would be a like a three point guide that you might? Yes. Well, we, we, we have a five point guide in the book, but um, the, five point, yeah. but, uh, the, I think I think the main ones are, are just make sure you start planning early enough um that's that's the real um that's the real big one make sure you've got plenty of time to do this because the time will run out quicker than you think um and then communication just make sure everyone knows what it involves make sure you're communicating to the people the ambitious people who want to be leaders that this can happen that these are the steps you need to take um because at the end of the day it's it's maybe not just your company it's all the people who work for you as well they're, they're all invested in it of course they are uh, and they have a right to know what the what the future holds. So um, two point plan: start planning early and communicate what you're doing. <laughs> how did you how did you see the the discussion about company vision and values manifest itself in some of these su- succession planning stories? So in in terms of um you know the, the companies actually did all the companies have a very clear set of values and principles that they wanted to uphold and a clear sort of twenty year business plan or was or others much more organic? No, I mean, I think it's much more organic. It's, it's difficult to talk about values. I don't think everyone, anyone ever sort of sits down and writes out, you know, what, what are our values uh, to be, you know, trustworthy, to be financially responsible. Or, uh, I've never I've never seen that document if it exists. But, um, but values don't, are... Don't, don't, don't RSHP have that on their website? And do they? And... <laughs> Maybe they do. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think they talk about sort of making... You know, positive contribution to, to humanity through their charity and, and that sort of support but maybe um, yes so um, it, it is much more organic like that they, they do feel a responsibility towards um, the charity that was set up obviously by Richard and um, which they will support going forward so, so, so in, yeah, in, in, in terms of upholding values yeah. and like how how a practice does it um, and, and, I mean, Grim, Grimshaw would be a good ex- a good example, kind of you know, reflecting what Mark was saying this week in the in the in the press that that perhaps they didn't, you know, there were um, Nick had an idea for like a smaller boutique firm, whereas lots of the younger partners had a vision for this global international practice, and Nick was very amenable and agreeable to to those ideas. But it was the values that they that they took forward. So I was interested in you know, how yeah. how do companies kind of cultivate and maintain values? Yeah, I mean that, that is that is an interesting question. I mean, I, I would say that the culture of a firm is is possibly again quite. Um, quite holistic and it's something that tends to be handed down from uh, person to person um, and I'm not, I'm not sure values are, are necessarily that fixed um, in BBJ talks about wanting to remain at the forefront and the cutting edge of architecture that's a very big thing for them um, to the extent that they will invest in robotics companies and things like that to give them the extra edge um, Roger Stoke Harbour Partners obviously support a, a charity very closely, and that's that's part of their raison d'être. Um, but I do think I do think values will also shift over time. So obviously, with Grimshaw, Nick wasn't that necessarily that keen on becoming an international practice, but allowed it to happen, possibly for the benefit of of his staff, who, who very much wanted that to happen. Uh, Henning Larson again. I don't think the founder was that interested in becoming international. It was after he. Um, passed away that they actually said well actually we can we can take this forward and become not just a Scandinavian brand but, but something that's a bit more all-encompassing and then they started to look at urban planning and things like that um, so I, I do think values and ambitions especially will shift over time it's just making sure that everyone is kind of comfortable with that happening 
Um, mm -hmm. And often it is driven by the next generation who see the opportunity for bigger and better things. Um, yeah. I don't think you'd necessarily want to stop that happening. Um, I don't think anyone really sort of says, well, we're just going to remain a three-person boutique firm if the, if the opportunity is there. Um, so maybe maybe it's, it's more to do with making sure that everyone's comfortable in the di direction of travel and and, uh, and having that in place before you start to start to push in that direction. Yeah, and um, you you also spoke with Arab. Um, they were another one in in the in the reports. And I'm get would I be right in thinking that they're the biggest practice or the biggest organisation or MBBJ? Uh, no, Arab definitely. I think um, Arab. Yeah, would, would be the biggest. Um, they they were very interesting because they also advise other people on this. So they've they've sort of done a lot of the groundwork as well. Um, and I mean, the big thing from them was making sure that you know once people leave, they don't necessarily come back like a you know uh, a ghost at the party uh, to <laughs> sort of say, well, you're not you're not or you know we want more money or whatever. It's so they they were very very certain about you know once you've decided that you're leaving, set a date for it leave and don't come back if you want to sort of offer advice then that's fine you know maybe take people out to dinner once a, once a, every six months or something and you can then you know in a neutral place and you can then express your views but don't don't be lingering around and telling everyone that one what they should be doing once you've decided to leave um so yeah. they're very clear about that and they're also very clear about the need to sort out your finances you don't want people complaining that they've been you know deprived of money or you don't want the next generation sort of saying well you haven't left us enough money for us to be able to to, to run this firm mm -hmm. so um i think those are the two two main points i took away from from arab but that's very interesting so, to speak to yeah. so, so that's interesting that arab now advise other practices and obviously when you get to that kind of scale of what 15 16 thousand people or so in the in the in the practice yeah that you know, we're talking like a little town now essentially yeah, exactly. yeah. It, it's 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 a proper organization um and so you can imagine that succession is just that's happening all the time yeah absolutely i mean another interesting thing that was thrown up by that and actually possibly coming back to the, the point you made earlier about how you uh, preserve values from generation to generation is um they're very they're very keen on forging trust all the different parts of arab have to trust all the other different parts of arab in order to make sure the firm is going forward so there's got to be that that sort of level of, of trust before you can really achieve anything um i think they were very clear about that very interesting excellent and and so is this a a, a thread of um study and of journalism that you'll you'll wish to continue as it yeah, definitely. The, the business side of architecture is, is fascinating to me, but then I'm, I'm a very boring man, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. But hopefully I get to write about this in, in the future as well. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for um, in, enlightening us there about the, you know, the, the succession of various architectural practices and engineering practices in the UK. It's a fascinating report um, that's now, it's, you, know, you can easily get it online um, from from ING Media, um, is there any other publications surrounding it? That no, uh, not not at the moment. Uh, but hopefully, maybe a follow up at some point. But um, for, for the time being, this is this is the document you need. So get in touch with ING Media. Excellent, brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating. Right, thank you, Vic. Thank you. Pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.